have a small group, but uh, maybe others will join us as we go along. Uh, so, um, buongiorno. Hey, buongiorno. Hello, everybody. Uh, Mario knows that's all the Italian. Um, uh, 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 welcome to KOR, uh, to our program for the spring semester. Classified phenomena. Our guest is Claudio Agnoli, and uh, his plane was late, so he's live from Calabria, Italy. I think he's at his office in the University of Calabria, where he's the librarian in the Science and Technology Library. Claudio uh, is a prolific author and a very active member of the International Society for Knowledge Organization. Um, he is uh, one of three authors with Rick Shostak and Maria Jose Lopez Huertas, a really exciting new book about interdisciplinarity. And uh, the work he's going to tell us about today is very much related to that. It's the idea that classifying phenomena instead of disciplines might yield a better interdisciplinary uh, knowledge organization system. So, Patty, I'm going to stop and let you talk. Over to you. Uh, Okay, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Richard, and uh, all the uh, key old people for inviting me. Uh, it's a great occasion to, to, for me to speak uh, to the U.S. colleagues. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, classifying phenomena. So you all know what the knowledge organization systems are and that there are several kinds of them. Uh, from simpler uh, ones like uh, keyword systems, including folksonomies, tagging systems, uh, subject adding lists uh, uh, common in uh, libraries, thesauri, taxonomies, classification schemes, ontologies, and so on. Uh, yesterday I just discovered a possible new cost type called ologs, uh, so uh, th there, can have, there can be plenty of them. Um, <coughs> Um, some of these uh, systems uh, usually list uh, phenomena. Are, they are basically lists and uh, schemes of phenomena. For example, uh, uh, this is the case with taxonomies, uh, like scientific uh, taxonomies or in, in zoology or astronomy or anything. Uh, and in thesauri, like the art and architecture thesaurus, and also subject adding lists. Uh, like uh, uh, LCSH you are probably familiar with. Um, so you have, for example, a, 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 an entry of uh, animals uh, with uh, broader terms, narrower terms. Sorry, it's not BT, it's NT actually. Uh, so what they are uh, about uh, are uh, objects of knowledge. They directly talk about animals, not about the science of something. Uh, on the other hand, uh, classification schemes like uh, Dewey or Library of Congress classification, uh, UDC, and so on, uh, usually list disciplines. So uh, you can find uh, uh, zoology or malacology, the science of studying mollusks, but not directly mollusks. Uh, this fact uh, is uh, even stated uh, as a kind of dogma by some authors, like uh, my friend Aida Slavic uh, here. Uh, who wrote that bibliographic classifications are not and cannot be taxonomic, uh, that is, they cannot be uh, lists of phenomena. They are, by all means, aspects or disciplinary classifications. This means that, what? It means that uh, one concept in all disciplines and fields uh, where that concept might be studied. For example, water, uh, the concept of water, will have to appear under chemistry, physics, and geology. And we know that uh, the we, uh, LCC, uh, and so on, work in this way. Uh, and AIDA continues, this is of critical importance for information retrieval, as aspect classification helps to establish the context in which one concept or phenomenon might be studied within the document. So uh, this would be the, the, reason, the rationale uh, for which uh, uh, classifications have to be disciplinary. And also, uh, Elaine Svenonius, in her important book, uh, The Intellectual Foundation of Information Organization, 
uh, states the same thing. Uh, classification schemes are disciplinary. So, <clears throat> what I will be talking today is uh, uh, exactly the, the, the opposite of this. <laughs> that is the, the alternative to this, I should say. Um, for example, in the UE decimal classification, this is uh, a, a, an application of DOE we have here in Pavia. Uh, actually, if you look for water, you can find the water under uh, uh, thermal water uh, uh, in geology uh, or uh, water in hydrology, uh, water provision as uh, uh, hydraulic engineering, uh, water features uh, in uh, uh, land planning and architecture. So water occurs many times in the same uh, classification scheme. And actually, uh, despite uh, uh, Slavic and Svenonius uh, claim, uh, there have been uh, some classificationists in the last century uh, who have uh, um, attempted to work with uh, classification not based on disciplines, uh, and usually the alternative is called phenomenon-based classification, as we will see. Uh, already uh, James Duff Brown, at the beginning of 20th century, produced uh, a subject classification uh, which uh, listed uh, um, concretes and countries and so on. And he stated explicitly that uh, uh, these were his basic categories. Uh, in the middle uh, of uh, 20th century, there was uh, the work of classification research group uh, authors, uh, and among them, especially Barbara Kyle, uh, Douglas Foskett, and Derek Austin, uh, worked on the possibility of a classification of entities, uh, activities, and properties, so a classification of phenomena as opposed to disciplines. They made uh, deep studies on these uh, kind of classification in view of uh, producing a new general uh, classification scheme granted by NATO. Uh, this scheme eventually was not completed, but there are uh, important drafts and important research by these authors. Uh, also, uh, another uh, recent classification, Dalberg's information coding classification, can be said to be based uh, partly on phenomena, or anyway, it's not disciplinary. It's a kind of cross, uh, uh, crossing between uh, uh, what I call phenomena and Ingetrad called um, um, objects, of, uh, objects of knowledge and uh, uh, aspect categories, which anyway are not exactly disciplines. So it's partly on these, uh, in, in this view. Uh, recently, also uh, important authors like Bechtel, uh, Elin Jacob, uh, Bella Haas Weinberg wrote papers uh, claiming that uh, uh, classification could be based uh, on phenomena and could uh, uh, go beyond uh, uh, the grid of uh, disciplines. Um, even more recently, I and other collaborators started a research project uh, to build an experimental integrative levels classification. I will show something later uh, based on phenomena. And also, uh, Rick Shostak uh, proposed a similar uh, scheme called the basic concept classification. I know that uh, Rick was a speaker at uh, um, your group uh, last year, so maybe this can be uh, reconnected to what he says he said uh, so at least uh, this possibility is worth to be explored uh, despite uh, the, the claim uh, we saw before uh, another statement in this direction was uh, the so-called Leon manifesto it's uh, a, some uh, statements uh, that uh, uh, Rick Shostak, Lopez Huertas, uh, I and other people present at that uh, uh, ISCO Spain conference in 2007 uh, um, developed. Uh, um, it was a conference uh, on the team of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity in knowledge organization. So uh, 
we proposed that uh, uh, new knowledge organization systems are required by uh, the need for interdisciplinarity. Uh, they are feasible, they should be based on phenomena indeed, uh, plus uh, theories and methods uh, as uh, uh, Rick Shostak in particular recommends. And the, uh, these uh, um, categories, uh, phenomena, theories and methods uh, should be uh, connected by a synthetic approach similarly to traditional faceted classification. I think we now can call uh, faceted classification traditional. <laughs> so I am now uh, writing a series of papers on just this subject uh, which is corresponding uh, uh, to the topic of this, uh, um, of this conference, uh, of this uh, lecture, sorry. Uh, and I call it uh, classifying phenomena. Uh, some of them are, are published already in uh, two issues, uh, recent issues of knowledge organization. A third one uh, will appear in uh, uh, Richard and Urlili's book uh, on facets, uh, which is in preparation. Uh, I hope I didn't spoil it anything. <laughs> And uh, I am writing a uh, part four, and maybe I will uh, uh, someday write uh, part uh, five. And uh, the idea is that uh, they could be collected in a, in a single book uh, uh, someday. But anyway, uh, the, the topics are what I am uh, talking at today. <coughs> the first uh, point is that in knowledge organization, we can identify a series of dimensions. Uh, what are dimensions? It's um, what uh, uh, Brian Vickery called uh, the steps from the world to the classifier. So, so what are we actually uh, indexing when we index uh, uh, documents and their contents? Uh, what well, a first dimension uh, in a, theoretically is reality in itself, uh, but uh, we know that uh, humans don't uh, uh, know reality directly, but they don't it. Uh, they know it uh, through the, our uh, sense organs and intellect. So what actually have uh, are phenomena, so dimension beta. Uh, dimension alpha uh, can be maybe studied by uh, mystic approaches or religion or what you want. And so uh, it's not directly the object of knowledge organization. Um, while phenomena are studied by ontology, that is the science of what exists and what kinds of things exist. Uh, every phenomenon can be treated under different perspectives, uh, and this is dimension gamma. And this is the, the dimension that is usually prior in uh, uh, traditional classification schemes, uh, as perspectives include the disciplines. And these are studied by epistemology. Then uh, the same perspective on uh, uh, the same phenomena can be treated in different documents. So this is the material uh, dimension of, uh, uh, of knowledge. And there are also disciplines studying, this, studying these material approaches like bibliology, epigraphy, and so on. Uh, yeah. uh, the same document, again, can be uh, uh, gathered in different collections. Uh, you have uh, libraries, archives, uh, museums, uh, as it is uh, common uh, to, to acknowledge uh, uh, nowadays. And so we have library science, but also museology, archive science, and so on, wh which deals with this uh, organizational institutional dimension. Um, then we, you have information needs, uh, that is what uh, uh, people need and the reason why people uh, uh, check these collections, which is, can be studied uh, by information science and also by cognitive uh, approaches. And finally, you have people. Uh, the same person can have different information needs uh, according to uh, his uh, motivation. Uh, for example, the same person can uh, uh, have a, a need to, to compile a bibliography for her degree thesis or uh, to read the novel in, in holidays. So uh, people and information needs are different dimensions. Okay, what is uh, relevant uh, for us today is the, uh, these uh, uh, dimensions beta for phenomena and gamma for perspectives. Perspectives uh, include disciplines, as I was saying, uh, 
but also domains uh, which are uh, discussed in Jorland's domain analysis uh, or the, the need for cultural warrant uh, as uh, um, discussed by Begtol in various important papers. Uh, subject ontogeny, the fact that uh, uh, the meaning of a subject heading uh, can change in time, as uh, emphasized by Joseph Tennis. The theories and methods uh, that by which uh, the same phenomenon can be studied. Uh, the communicative function discussed in an interesting book by Hutchins, and so on. So perspectives are all the um, the viewpoints from which we look at a given object of, of knowledge. Uh, a short uh, um, digression about uh, dimensions Z and eta, that is information needs and people. Uh, I recently noticed that this can be relevant to a, a common discussion, a common debate in knowledge organization. Uh, in this tweet, uh, David Bowden uh, reported about a, a discussion occurring at the Con Con Colis uh, uh, Conceptions of Library and Information Science conference uh, uh, in Uppsala last year. And there were um, speakers uh, uh, proposing a, a cognitive uh, uh, approach to, to knowledge. And uh, there you can see Birger Jörland standing and discussing this approach as he uh, supports a sociological approach. So there is often a, 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 an opposition between these uh, um, positions. But this uh, uh, analysis of the dimensions of knowledge organization uh, allows us to, uh, to, to, see, to say that both uh, dimensions are relevant. A cognitive approach is relevant to, to study the information needs dimension and sociological approach is relevant uh, to study the people dimension, who is the user of knowledge, why he has, is motivated to uh, have a certain knowledge, and so on. So uh, maybe this uh, list of dimensions can bring some light to this uh, uh, frequent uh, discussion. Okay, so the, the, the proposal is that classification can also be based on phenomena as an alternative to um, disciplines. Uh, this is a concrete example. Uh, on the right you have a traditional classification where you can find biology, which is di divided into mycology, botany, zoology, and so on. On the left you have uh, a phenomenon-based classification corresponding to the similar top, uh, with similar topics. As you can see, in practice, this could be quite similar. Uh, it, it can, you, can, you could tell me it's just a matter of words. You, you call them fungi or fungi or mycology, but uh, in practice, uh, the, the books uh, are the same. Uh, so it, it's not like simple like that, but uh, for some purposes, uh, the, the resulting uh, list of classes can be uh, similar. For example, the, the Bliss bibliographic classification is a, a disciplinary classification, but uh, the, the sequence of main classes uh, is uh, um, based on the theory of integrative levels uh, developed by the classification research group, which also studied the classification of phenomena. So um, some principles are common anyway. I'm not. Uh, telling that we should revolutionize everything. What can be the difference? Uh, in a phenomenon-based classification, a phenomenon has a place of unique definition, as it, will, it was called by Jason Faraday. That is, it occurs only once uh, in, the, in the scheme, in the schedules. Uh, so it gets a stable notation, and this notation can be used to uh, retrieve uh, the, 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 the concept uh, uh, in any combination. So let's keep the same example of water uh, by Slavic. Mm. You can have soils uh, with water in them. You can have provision of water. You can have landscapes with water. You can have water which is made of oxygen. And every 
subject uh, could be in a different discipline, in a disciplinary classification, uh, but water, uh, in our case, uh, will keep uh, always the same notation. So it, it's uh, something that can be relevant for uh, information retrieval as well. One uh, advantage is uh, uh, for interdisciplinarity. Uh, Richard mentioned that this book uh, we, we wrote uh, last year, we published the last year. Um, um, the argument is that uh, uh, researchers um, working uh, in an interdisciplinary way could be um, could have uh, uh, disadvantages in using a, a disciplinary based classification. It can be a forcing grid uh, inducing you to, to uh, always keep the same uh, uh, way of, of thinking, while uh, if uh, the system is interdisciplinary, it, it should encourage uh, a relationship between different uh, uh, subjects. Uh, the fact that water is in different uh, uh, disciplines can be uh, meaningful. Uh, it can give you new ideas uh, on, on how to connect these. Uh, and this is, uh, has to do with how we conceive knowledge organization. Uh, traditional classifications uh, use knowledge organization as something that uh, can uh, just uh, uh, represent and report the status quo of knowledge. As books uh, are organized in this way, we're, we also reproduce them in classification. While uh, in, uh, in an interdisciplinary approach, we could take a more proactive uh, role, that is, we we provide concepts uh, and uh, the researchers can use them to discover new relationships. So it's more creative. And also a, a recent talk by Patrick Lambe advocated for a more proactive role uh, of knowledge organization. So that's just an idea uh, about how to conceive our, uh, the, the role of our field. Uh, another relevant notion is a theme. Um, team is, uh, 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 I mean, uh, in, in, a, in a document, there can, you can have several themes, uh, the, the, the topics uh, the document is about, uh, and these themes are connected uh, by uh, facets, by relationships. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we can usually identify a base team and several particular themes, uh, as uh, uh, text linguistics teach uh, us. Uh, for example, in the combinations we already uh, saw, we have soils uh, with water, provision of water, and so on. So water uh, is uh, often a particular theme, but in the last uh, example, water made of oxygen, water is the base theme. So it's expressed in the first, uh, uh, it's cited in the first position in the usual practice of uh, uh, subject indexing. Okay, so I take this example. What does it does this mean? Uh, this uh, affects uh, the the resulting uh, um, order of how concepts are listed, uh, not just in traditional uh, file cabinets like this one, but also in uh, uh, computer displays. For example, when you are browsing a list of concepts, uh, or when you are browsing uh, the results of a of a query. Um, so. When uh, the, the, our concept, uh, water, is the base theme, it will be cited first, so it will be grouped uh, together with other uh, documents on water as the base theme. While, in the other cases, uh, it will be grouped under soils or under provision or under landscapes and so on. Uh, so this contradicts uh, the, the one criticism Aida Slavic uh, uh, expressed to me in an interesting discussion that is a, a phenomenon classification would create a useless group because all documents would be filed underwater, but uh, it's not useful to, for researchers that uh, you have everything concerning with water together because the context changes. But also in phenomenon-based classification, the concept can, the context can be, can change, and this depends uh, on the order. This is expressed by the order of uh, uh, 
concepts. So whether the, the concept is a base team or a particular team. Okay. Uh, now, these uh, uh, themes, uh, soils, water, provision, water, landscape, water conservation, and so on, uh, will be uh, expressed in a given citation order and will be connected uh, by proposition, in this case, with, uh, of, uh, which actually are uh, facets. So fa the role of facets in this case is to connect uh, uh, the different phenomena. We are familiar with the facets in a, a disciplinary classification. Uh, in phenomenon classification, you also can have facets, but uh, uh, with uh, this more free um, uh, functionality. Uh, this was called indeed free facets by Derek Costin, or also roles in uh, praises by again by Austin, and also corresponds more or less to what Ranganathan calls. Um, phase relationships. So phenomena have their facet categories just as discipline have. Uh, in disciplines we are familiar with uh, PNAST categories or similar lists. These are the analogous uh, uh, fundamental categories we developed uh, for uh, uh, the ILC scheme. Uh, so some categories are, are similar. They are, in a way, generalized. For example, we, we talk about the transformation instead of process, because process occurs in some uh, material events, uh, but not in mathematics, for example. But anyway, the, we have this, this general list uh, of uh, uh, facet categories, of fundamental categories. Uh, notice that the last, uh, facet, the last category is perspective. So this allows to connect the phenomenon-based system to the other dimensions, that is, to disciplines, to documents, and so on. So uh, the last facet is a door towards uh, uh, other dimensions. <laughs> this sounds very uh, mystical, but anyway. OK, in practice, uh, the, here are some examples of uh, uh, freely faceted combinations of phenomena. We have soils with water, soils uh, with water in them, and these are, are connected by category 7, which is part, so, so water as a part of soil. Uh, so these are free facets because you can combine anything with anything. And this is different from traditional facets, uh, like in uh, a column classification or a bliss classification uh, and so on, which are more bound facets uh, because they are specific of a given class. They depend on this main class. You can also have them with uh, uh, freely faceted classification. For example, soils have a, a, a facet of permeability. Clearly, permeability is a facet of soils. It's not a general facet of anything. And so this is expressed by a, a, a special facet starting by the digit 9. But it's not important. It's just an example. OK. Uh, coming back to uh, phenomena um, themselves, uh, how are you? Are we going to ordering them? Uh, um, if we need uh, to to have a, a list of main classes of phenomena, uh, we need some general principles, which uh, will be different from traditional uh, uh, disciplinary classifications. So one mm, classical principle is logical division. Uh, producing uh, the hierarchies of types we are familiar with, like in this case, they will just be uh, types of phenomena instead of types of disciplines or, or sub-disciplines uh, and their uh, um, divisions. And another important principle uh, can be that of uh, levels of organization, which is called in several ways in literature or integrative levels, uh, or levels of complexity, and so on, uh, they uh, rather produce arrays, that is a series of concepts in a given sequence. Uh, for example, cells, organs, populations are listed by increasing level of organization. And in another field, morphemes, words, and phrases 
all are uh, um, increasing levels of uh, uh, linguistic uh, uh, objects and so on. Even in uh, the history of uh, knowledge organization, there was this uh, model of the scala nature, so a ladder of increasingly uh, high uh, phenomena. <coughs> and this traditionally also corresponded to an increasing value uh, for medieval authors, uh, uh, material phenomena at a, a less value than uh, a living phenomena and then uh, spiritual and then uh, God at the top. Uh, this is not necessarily uh, applied in uh, a modern, the modern uh, uh, conception of levels of organization. Or maybe we can say that uh, yes, the higher levels are, have more value in the sense that they are informational, more rich. Uh, they, they exist because the previous levels exist. But of course, we are not doing uh, uh, general value judgment. We are doing knowledge organization here. So it's a neutral, uh, try to be a neutral um, approach. Although it's true that philosophy is always, uh, philosophical assumptions are always present in knowledge organization. I'm not denying this. OK, so we have uh, two important uh, uh, principles, types and levels. Uh, several types are uh, related by a relation of inclusion, uh, which accounts for the morphology that is uh, um, the, the different type. Types are different because of their uh, uh, shape or more in general the morphology of the phenomena. Uh, similar, similar objects can be grouped into types. Uh, well, levels are related by a relationship of emergence, which account for phylogeny. That is, it, it is often connected to the history of uh, this phenomenon. From a simpler uh, phenomenon, uh, more complex uh, levels uh, have emerged. So there is uh, a, a dialogue between these two uh, principles, morphology and phylogeny. Uh, so, uh, the, the crossing of types and levels can provide the basic structure of such a classification. Okay, and this is uh, discussed in detail in the part two of my series of papers. Just one uh, uh, interesting question. Uh, morphology and phylogeny often are correlated. Uh, that is, uh, uh, similar objects uh, uh, also have a similar origin, a similar history, but not always. Uh, there are cases where uh, they rather conflict. For example, similar phenomena can originate separately and then converge, like in the case of the hydrodynamic shape of uh, uh, whales and ichthyosaurs, I don't know about pronunciation, and fishes. Uh, which are, all have a different origin, but similar shape. So they would be grouped by morphology, but separated by uh, phylogeny. On the other hand, uh, commonly originated phenomena often diverge morphologically. A, a, a clamorous, uh, an incredible example is that of uh, birds, uh, which have evolved from reptiles, uh, and in a strict uh, uh, phylogenetic approach uh, should even be listed uh, under reptiles. So uh, some biologists uh, would say that birds are reptiles. But we also know that uh, birds are very different from reptiles morphologically. So how should we classify them, by phylogeny or by morphology? And there are uh, uh, indeed uh, alternative strategies. Uh, as uh, well explained by uh, Jorland's entry on classification in the recent uh, ISCO Encyclopedia of Knowledge Organization. Basically, we can, you can give priority to morphology, and this is the approach of phonetics in biology. So the result is that birds and reptiles are different classes because they are very different. You can uh, give priority to phylogeny, as uh, done by the cladistics school of biology, which is today the mainstream school. 
So uh, strictly, uh, you will say that birds are just a kind of reptiles, which is strange for the layman. Or uh, you can uh, try to balance both, uh, to take into account both morphology and phylogeny. And so uh, you can say that reptiles and birds are uh, two main classes, they are sister classes, uh, despite the fact that birds uh, are derived from reptiles. Because uh, you have emergence, so new classes can emerge from pre-existing classes. Uh, there is a biologist who suggested this idea years ago, Julian Huxley, who proposed the notion of grades in biology. It, it has not big success in biology, but it's basically corresponding to our notion of levels in knowledge organization, uh, which in my opinion is quite promising. Uh, he even suggested that animals and humans could also be sister classes. We all know that humans derived from a given branch of primates and so on and so on. But we also know that humans are very different. They have language, they have spirituality, they have a lot of things. Uh, and so this is enough to create a new uh, class, uh, what Huxley called the psychozoa. Okay, so by this uh, approach we can try to identify the main uh, levels uh, of phenomena, which is of course uh, a, a debated question. Uh, here you have several philosophers uh, who de dealt with uh, levels. Conway Lloyd Morgan, Se Roy Sellers, uh, Nikolai Hartmann, Roberto Poli and Karl Popper. Uh, as you can see, they proposed uh, slightly different lists of uh, the major levels, uh, what Hartmann calls strata, as he distinguished them uh, from uh, uh, minor levels or layers, uh, but that's a complicated question. And uh, uh, as you can see, at the same time, there is some correspondence, uh, so there is uh, some uh, um, agreed uh, idea uh, around. Uh, of course, uh, the details can be discussed uh, and uh, they are partly in my uh, uh, paper uh, classific classifying phenomena part two. So we get to uh, obtain uh, a basic list of main classes, uh, forms, matter, life, minds, society and culture each one divided into other classes uh, of, uh, again, uh, listed by integrative levels. And this can be the, the, the skeleton of a classification of phenomena based on uh, morphology and phylogeny. Actually, the classification research group uh, did just this uh, in the 60s. This is an excerpt of their uh, scheme, uh, draft scheme uh, for NATO. As you can see, uh, there is a list uh, of uh, land, uh, geocentric, living systems, viruses, organisms, plants, animals, men, uh, just in Huxley, and so on. But unfortunately, this uh, uh, didn't uh, get to, to a complete and usable classification. So, uh, I liked the idea very much, and with some other collaborators in the ILC project, we are developing a similar system, which is inspired by the CRG draft and their, especially their research and published papers. It expresses main classes subclass, and subclasses by small caps uh, and facets by digits. Uh, this is not uh, a random choice uh, because, uh, uh, well, okay, you, we are, you are aware with the 10 uh, uh, fundamental categories, so digits is good rather than the opposite. Uh, and also, um, digits are listed before um, letters uh, in standard ASCII um, uh -huh. system in any computer. So this will have effects uh, uh, for automatic uh, uh, sorting in, in any computer. And it's, uh, uh, it agrees with the uh, facet analytical theory that facets are listed before subclasses. 
the integrative levels classification is an ongoing research project. It by no means uh, is a, a finalized classification, but uh, it is quite developed. It has uh, 7,000 uh, classes now. Uh, we consolidated uh, edition one in 2011 just to have uh, some uh, fixed points, sorry. And, uh, uh, and uh, we are still developing an edition two and uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's a long work. Uh, it's an international team with various uh, people, currently no women, but uh, there were women in the past. And uh, we welcome new collaborators. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, for example, for a thesis or, a, or for editing a, a specific group of classes, uh, just contact us. Uh, it can be interesting. Uh, there is already some application of this experimental system. Uh, in general, we need more applications uh, to evaluate a phenomenon-based classification. I'm, I am talking on a theoretical plane uh, until now, but of course uh, uh, you have to check uh, uh, whether it, this works uh, and uh, whether it is uh, um, competitive with the discipline uh, classifications. Uh, there was the first very little experiment reported in our book, uh, Interdisciplinary uh, Knowledge Organization. There are uh, some little databases, that, like the bioacoustic reference database, uh, which were indexed by this uh, system, previous version of it, actually. And now there is a collaboration with the BARTOC, which is a very important resource in general. It is uh, the main directory of knowledge organization systems in, in overall now, uh, edited by Andreas Ledel in uh, Switzerland and uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, courses in Bartok are now indexed also by ILC. Uh, they are also indexed by Dewey and by Eurovoc, so some comparison will be possible in the future. Uh, some last uh, slides uh, uh, concerning disciplines. Uh, how can we deal with disciplines uh, uh, once we have uh, uh, based our system on phenomena. Actually, it's not impossible to express disciplines in such a system. Uh, as already suggested by Barbara Kyle in the 50s, uh, disciplines are but uh, a one cultural phenomenon, so they will be listed at the level of cultural phenomena. Why in this system? Uh, why is this no is knowledge? And uh, knowledge includes uh, YS sciences, YT techniques, and uh, uh, they include, in turn, uh, the traditional disciplines. So they are there, but uh, they have, again, a place of unique definition. Uh, it's also possible to combine phenomena and discipline by the uh, zero facets uh, I mentioned uh, uh, previously. Um, I will show you an example, a practical example. We have our uh, class of soils. Uh, J, Y, okay, and uh, you can uh, express the fact that soils are studied in geology or that st soils are studied in agronomy, so the same phenomenon uh, under the different perspectives and um, in different disciplines, and this is uh, expressed by facet uh, 07. Uh, also, other perspective facets can be expressed, for example, the method uh, recommended by Shostak, can be studied by can be expressed by zero three soils uh, studied through photography as a method. Okay, I think I have uh, uh, finished uh, the basic presentation. So uh, here are some contacts uh, for those who are particularly interested, and uh, I am also now um, at your. Uh, disposition for any discussion if I can understand the uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Or comments. <laughs>
just by jumping into one presentation. Um, so I'm having a hard time framing my question, but I do have some. <laughs> Can you hear her, Claudia? Uh, some way, but maybe uh, we could use the chat as well. It would be easier for me. Sorry. And then I, I reply. No, no. Thanks. Is that better if I sit up here by the microphone? Yeah, it is better actually. Um, I was saying before, it's hard for me to ask questions because I don't really understand a lot of what I heard today. I'm trying to make sense of it. Um, I'm trying to understand the difference between having these concept facets mm. in kind of a, it, instead of just having concept facets that you could apply to an already existing classification, you're proposing an entirely new classification. Um, can you address that a little bit? Um, yeah. There are several uh, several aspects uh, I, I concentrated in one presentation. Um, one one uh, aspect is the, the the general possibility of having uh, a, any classification based on phenomena. Uh, uh, then I showed uh, uh, some examples from one such classification, which is ILC, but others can be uh, in, in principle developed. And uh, actually, uh, Shostak is proposing another one. But uh, I think the most important thing is uh, whether a system is based on disciplines or it is based on phenomena. And maybe okay. you, you wonder why should should we change any classification? Uh, uh, of course, I, we, we can use the existing systems. Uh, we are using Dewey in my library, I, uh, I, I have to say. so. Uh, of course, the real world is uh, going on with existing systems, but this is also for practical reasons because it's very long to introduce uh, new systems. Great. I have a question. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Laura. Um, how are you? What techniques are you using to examine concepts and recombine them in ways that um, illuminate the relationships between them currently? Yeah, you mentioned that there was one practical application. And I'm just curious um, if you have ideas about how you are going to go about examining this in other areas. Mm, yeah. So, so, Do you mean technically or, or conceptually, or both? Um, I mean both, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, well, in, in my experience with ILC, uh, the start was quite uh, uh, broad, quite general. So I would say it's philosophical because we have to, to decide the, the basic uh, um, the basic classes of your system. Uh, so it's not a rigorous analysis, but it's a, it's a set of, uh, of notions. Uh, then uh, to develop uh, uh, classes in detail, of course, uh, uh, you can use uh, 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 approaches similar to those of uh, uh, other classifications, uh, so based on literature, uh, on other systems, existing systems, uh, and, and also logical division. Um, we, we are we are aware that we are not providing a, a, a complete system. We, we just have the broad uh, classes, and some uh, classes are more developed. For example, uh, whales, uh, cetaceans, are more developed because uh, we use the dam for uh, a particular application I, I showed before uh, for bioacoustics. Um, we have uh, uh, the system uh, recorded in a MySQL database. Uh, which can be edited uh, half manually <laughs> and uh, there is a PHP interface which produces automatically uh, uh, meaningful uh, uh, parts of the schedule and I would say the technology here is notation so it's an old technology <laughs> uh, because okay. uh, notation is conceived in, in 
such a way that uh, it gives a certain uh, order. I, I don't know if uh, uh, it's <laughs> Uh, Claudio, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm very, I've been reading the, the book recently, and I'm very interested um, in actually the same problem that, that I study in regular KO, which is what do you do when a word means different things or when the phenomenon you're trying to describe has different and un, not semantically similar uh, names. In other words, how do you find all of the how do you find all of the birds if some of them aren't called birds? I mean, how do you de how do you describe your your class of a phenomenon uh, exhaustively? Uh, um. So you mean a particular how a particular class is defined? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, we, we start with concepts uh, that are commonly used uh, in in a rigorous approach. Uh, yes, you could say what a bird is. Uh, okay, but uh, it would be a very a very long. <laughs> Uh, enterprise, so maybe this is more uh, uh, implemented in ontologies rather than in classifications. Um, we have uh, um, something connected to definition uh, in a in a database field for uh, um, the, um, concepts on which a concept depends. Uh, so, for example, when we have the concept of uh, uh, alpinism, uh, mountain climbing, uh, there is a relationship recorded uh, with mountains because you cannot have uh, uh, ma uh, alpinism if you have not mountains before. So there is some kind of uh, 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 definition relationship recorded. But of course, it's very long uh, enterprise yeah, because yeah. we are trying to 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 propose a general scheme. Uh, of course, uh, you could uh, take a, a specialized domain and do this in more detail. Okay, that's good. That's where I was going. So, so I think I heard you suggest that that's an ontological problem that that's that's related, but not the same as the classification structure. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Sorry, you are suggesting that uh, this kind of classification is connected to ontological uh, problems. Ontology, yeah, yeah, there is a, such a side. Um, there is also a, a strange kind of, uh, of course, uh, uh, called the, the Classorus by Bhattacharya uh, in the 70s. And it combined classification and thesaurus. So again, you have uh, to specify uh, related terms, uh, broader terms, narrower terms, uh, and at the synonyms especially. Uh, and at the same time, they are sorted in a classification. So I, I think we can conceive or, of richer systems uh, if provided you have time, you, you can record uh, everything. Well, that's what's that's what places like ours are for, right? We study one concept at a time. Mm -hmm. Questions? I have kind of a follow-up question based on Richard's question about polysemy. Um, so you mentioned that you're using the con dependent concepts to identify and um, figure out which signs belong to which concepts. So are you looking at the dependencies is context for the polysemous signs? Uh, the, the, mm, I, I'm not sure I have understood, but uh, it, it, the idea is that a concept is listed uh, in um, 
a concept uh, is listed uh, without context uh, in, in the general system, just because it has to be general. And then uh, the context is expressed in the particular combination uh, you have uh, in, in a document uh, or in, in a subject in general. So the context is uh, provided by the relationship with other uh, concepts. Okay, that, that makes sense. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Sukwan. Uh, thanks for our presentation. Um, I'm just um, curious to see um, what's, what was the uh, primary reason um, you guys want to invent a new system called a phenomenon based one? Compared to um, DDC or SSC, I think uh, um, there's advantages or disadvantages of the previous system. So, can you explain a little bit more of that? Yeah. Um... Yeah, maybe the, the motivation is just intellectual uh, curiosity because uh, um, indeed the, the discipline-based classification are very are very uh, widespread and uh, and I think they are very useful. Um, but uh, when you are using them, uh, in, in a way you. I was always puzzled uh, on about uh, why uh, everything starts with disciplines. Actually, the world is not done uh, uh, made uh, made with disciplines uh, alone. So it's something quite uh, experimental, um, and, and indeed it, it has developed uh, until now, especially in literature, so in theory of knowledge organization. Um, but uh, but it, it looks like some uh, um, some idea that uh, is here and there in literature, as we say, as we uh, saw uh, even in uh, at the early 10th century, um, early 20th century. So it it, uh, it can be forgotten, and uh, it's worth to be to be studied more in, in accurately, in my, in my opinion. It isn't, if I may, isn't the problem that disciplines create silos that prevent yeah. Uh, discovery? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So interdisciplinarity is uh, another point. More and more interdisciplinary. Yeah. To promote interdisciplinary discovery. Yeah. Well, and if you're promoting, if you want to promote interdisciplinary study. Um, there's this perspective where you have a classification uh, based on disciplines and so that locks you into those disciplines in a way because mm. the classification itself is defining almost what's possible because you're basing it on warrant. So would there be any consideration to promote, instead of doing it, how do I say, Instead of doing it in from the past and saying, okay, there are, there's warrant for these interdisciplinary areas, so we will um, allow you to create these a classification, a slot here for the interdisciplinarity. Um, is there some way to promote all the possibilities so that people feel they can fill those in? Do you know what I'm saying? I'm kind of going back with. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um actually also existing classific some existing classification uh, uh, allows some uh, combination between disciplines it allows to express relationship between disciplines especially UDC uh, as uh, many symbols uh, to express uh, uh, the coexistence of disciplines and maybe uh, interdisciplines can be expressed in this way as well um, but maybe this is uh, slightly different uh, because uh, your basic scheme is still based uh, on uh, disciplines, <laughs> uh, while uh, phenomena can uh, um, can allow you to organize everything in a different way from the start and and see what happens. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think that's all we have then. Claudia, it's been wonderful. Uh, yeah.
Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. It was great to, to be in the USA in, in this way and, uh, and uh, to have this experience. So thank you again for inviting me.